Good morning, church. It's great to see you this morning. This is another special day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice. Every 
break every chain break every chain to break every chain break every chain break every chain he's breaking every chain break every chain break every chain oh to break every chain to break every chain our God is breaking every chain. Break every chain. Break every chain. To break every chain. Break every chain. Break every chain. Break every chain. Lord, you're breaking every chain. Break every chain. Lord, you're breaking every chain. Depression, you're breaking every chain. Chains of sickness, you're breaking every chain. We're no longer bound, you're breaking every chain. We're no longer bound, you're breaking every chain. We accept your freedom today. Break every chain. 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 If you believe God has broken chains this morning, begin to open up your mouth and worship him. Begin to tell him thank you for breaking the chains off of your life. Thank him for freedom this morning. Break every chain. 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 There is power. Of Jesus, there is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. Sing, there is power. There is power in the name of Jesus. Sing, there is power. There is power. Break every chain, 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 break every chain. Hallelujah. You are out of Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for breaking all the chains, Lord. Only you could do this, Lord. Only you could do this, Lord. You know the chains that are on our hearts, Lord. You break them now, Lord. You can do this. We thank you. You are our everything, Lord. Thank you. Come on, let's acknowledge him today. He's Alpha and Omega. You are Alpha and Omega. We
You are Alpha. to read our first reading first. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Today's uh, reading will be Psalm 32. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the law does not count against them and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bone wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My, my strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. 
I say, I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgive the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty water will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from the trouble and surround me with the song of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the ways you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eyes on you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding but must be controlled by bit or brother, or they will not come to you. Many are those vows of the wicked, but the, law, the Lord's unfailing love surround the one who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord, be glad, you righteous. Sing all you who are upright in heart. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When I see Jesus, amen. When I see Jesus, amen, all my troubles, it will be over, when I see Jesus, amen, when I see Jesus, Amen. When I see Jesus, Amen. All my troubles, it will be over. When I see Jesus, Amen. Amen, 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 all my troubles, it will be over, when I see Jesus. Jesus, when I see the Master, when I see Jesus, when I see my precious Savior, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I have a disclaimer. I did not consult with the music ministry, but they are all in my sermon today. And so I just thank God that he visits everyone and gives all of us a message this morning. So thank you so, so much for the music ministry. I just want to take one moment and call out your Lenten bulletin. Hopefully I didn't make that noise. Your Lenten bulletin. I started reading it. It's excellent. So as a, re, as a discipline for Lenten, I certainly urge you to read it this week. There's something for each day. I especially like the message for Sunday. This morning, I'm sharing with you a message from Isaiah about fasting. This message about fasting is appropriate for Lent because many of us fast during Lent. So let's hear what God has to say about true fasting. Let's hear the word of the Lord. Shout it out loud. Do not hold back. Raise your voice 
like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the descendants of Jacob their sins. For day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways, as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. Why have we fasted, they say, and have you not seen it? We have humbled ourselves and you have not noticed. Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please. This is God's answer, excuse me, God's answer. On the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of feast I have chosen? Only a day for people to humble themselves? It is only for bowing one's head like a reed or for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is this not the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loose the change of, of injustice and to untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke, is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked, to clothe them, to not turn away from your own flesh and blood. Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and he will say, here am I. Here ends the reading of the verses from Isaiah on fasting for our hearts and our minds to take in, the kind of fasting that God wants us to do. Our second lesson is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 17, verses 1 through 13. Now, last Sunday was the Sunday when we recognized the transfiguration. But I, my message today continues that information, so we're still reading from this lesson. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. And the disciples asked him, why then do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? And Jesus replied, to be sure, Elijah comes and will restore all things. But I tell you, Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him. But I have done to him but have done to him anything they wished, in the same way the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was talking to them about John the Baptist. Here is the reading of the gospel lesson. Thanks be to God. 
Now, I realize I've been here twice before, but I haven't told you much about myself. So I'm going to start with just sharing a few things about who I am. I grew up in a very ecumenical background. I started out Baptist. My parents and my great-grandparents were members of Enon Baptist Church in Philadelphia. And when I was eight, my parents not only moved from my grandparents' home to their own home, but there was a new pastor in the community who, went, who had just been assigned to the Episcopal Church. He went through the community and recruited them to join the Episcopal Church. Remember, I started out Baptist, and now we're in the Episcopal Church. Also, on Sundays, I had an aunt who lived with us. She was a maid. Uh, and on the weekend, she came and stayed with us. And she was Catholic. She didn't see very well. So it was my job to walk with her to Mass at 8 o'clock on Sunday mornings. Um, mass in those days, we're talking the 1950s. Yeah, that's how old I am. Mass in those days was in Latin. So I didn't know a word that was being said. But I learned how to genuflect correctly before I went into the pew. And I learned that since I was going to the Episcopal Church, the names of the prayers they were reciting in Latin were in my prayer book, prayer book, or the common book of prayer in the Episcopal Church. So even though I didn't know what they were saying, the exact same names. So I was reciting them in English and hearing them first in Latin each Sunday morning. Now when I turned 17, I went to college and I moved to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And there I met my husband, I became a teacher after I finished college, met my husband, and my husband was AME. Okay, got it? Okay, and my husband was from Western Pennsylvania. In fact, his father had come to the mountains in Pennsylvania to be a coal miner. He lived in the farthest western, almost to the border of West Virginia, and each Sunday we drove two hours to go to church with his dad because his mother had died. We were the ones that lived in the area, and we spent every Sunday with his dad. We, went, we left home at 9 o'clock in the morning, went to church with him at 11, stayed all day, and came home at the end of the day and drove two hours back to home. Eventually, we finally bought our own home, and also my beloved father-in-law became ill and passed. And I said to my husband, I am no longer driving two hours to church each way, spending all day out in the country when there's a church two blocks down the street from us in this new house, and it was Presbyterian. Okay, so that's how I got to be Presbyterian. Just so you know a little background. Okay, my husband said I'm never joining. He joined too. Okay, after our daughter was born, he decided it was time for him to join too. As a youth, I was unaware of the polity of each denomination I was in. But as an adult, I have come to appreciate the polity of the Presbyterian Church because of its equity and balance of distribution of power between clergy and lay leaders. And one of the things I really like about being in this church is the fact that it pivots to current issues that impact people today. And also, those in Jesus' day. Now, let me, you know a little something more about me. Now I want to pivot to our lesson. Today, my sermon is entitled, Freedom Rising. And I was so glad you started with the hymn, Oh Freedom, because it's going to resonate throughout my message today. The Old Testament lesson from 58 challenges our litten disciplines. God offers a discipline that compels us not to think about self, but about others. With the beginning of Lent this year, it will be approximately three years, almost to the week, when the world was thrust, kicking and streaming, into a global pandemic. I don't have all the words to describe what we've been through, 
But here are just a few. Death, loss, anger, isolation, sorrow, fake remedies, confusion, and a medical intervention. And while I can also describe these remedies for the pandemic with these adjectives, it also has brought a time of discovery of new solutions, introspection, adaptation, and hope too. However, there's been so much pain and suffering compared to the relative positives that we found in seeking new ways of doing things. One of the major adaptations has been technology. Creative worship changes that we had to adapt and adopt. We had some real revelations about how we could use those things and about also what was important and what was not. The passage from Isaiah reminds us of what God considers important. The difficult questions about whether we value our community and each other or think only of ourselves. Sometimes we choose to blame others for the problems in the world. But God, but God is telling us what is really important. We cannot be ambivalent witnesses or worse accomplices to the pain that is in our communities, in our nation and in the world. We are called to be part of the solution a real revelation about the definition of hate and love. And with God's help, and with God's word, as we just said, God is the Alpha and the Omega, with God's word is the last word, we must be part of the solutions for the future of us all. And what I call the beloved community is what God wants. And God asks us during Lent to give thought to this difficult task. Now our lesson from Matthew retells the story of the transfiguration. Jesus took three of the disciples, Peter, James, John, up on a high mountain, and he was transfigured before them, appearing in the auspicious company of Moses and Elijah. Now Moses, of course, was the great liberator and the person who brought the law and the commandments to the Israelites. And Elijah was a great prophet during the days of King Ahaz and Jezebel. If I just say the word Jezebel, you already know that was about the time when there were all those idols. And Elijah challenged those people who worshiped Baal to light an altar with their God and then had them pour water on that altar and ask God to light the altar up. And guess what? God lit it up with fire also causing the death of all those false prophets. Great liberators from the Old Testament who summoned memories of the law and the prophets. Jesus' clothes in this transfiguration are described as dazzling white. And this is a symbolic reference to the glory of the resurrection. Because remember in the resurrection, Jesus' clothes are dazzling white. In Matthew's story, this scene follows on the heels of a watershed moment where Jesus predicts his death and resurrection for the first time. Look it up, Matthew 16. Thus, with a glance backwards and forward, I keep hitting this microphone, and forward to the future, Matthew links Jesus' death, life, Resurrection to the story of God's activity in days gone by, manifest in the gift of the law and the ministries of all of Israel's prophets. And just as God connected to them in their time, God connects to us in our day. Given this just a position of the transfiguration story with Jesus' first passion prediction, remember I said he predicted his life, his death, his resurrection, or sight into what was going to come in the future, because for us at the end of Lent comes our Passion Week, we are first introduced to Jesus' way of life, of taking up the cross. Yes. In fact, immediately in the verses preceding this chapter 17, Jesus says, if you want to follow me, 
Let you deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. To add an exclamation point to this, the very voice of God breaks in and says, this is my son, listen to him. In listening to Jesus, it means we have to reckon with cross-bearing. Not only is the way of Jesus' life, but also the way of our disciplines in our lives as disciples. All of this entails potential conflict with the status quo. You cannot follow Jesus without calling out what is un-Jesus-like in the world, then and also today, because we too as Christians must bear the causes of our time. It's important to clarify what I mean when I say cross-bearing. It's not a reference to necessarily accepting suffering in our lives, but rather it means naming the crosses that bear down on our lives and those around us. That is calling out the realities that oppress and disfigure our lives and that of all of creation. These crosses that defy God's intention for us. It means naming and resisting those savage forces. Jesus is teaching us, taking up our cross and being agitational, calling us to name and resist the many crosses in our landscapes that defy God's will for all of us. In our current landscape, that means racism, sexism, classism, misogyny, homophobia, abuses of power, white supremacy, and anything that deals with hate, to name a few. And I heard on the news yesterday that there were people who decided that yesterday would be a day of hate. Oh my God. And they would target people going to worship in the synagogue. What is wrong with them? What is wrong with them? Those are the crosses we have to deal with. When Jesus calls us to take up those crosses, he is calling us to face the tension and the agitation of naming and resisting these forces and to be fully aware of the consequences that can happen as a result. Same as the consequences Jesus faced as a result of him facing those forces in his time. In some, that transfiguration story help us to discern the way of God in Jesus' way to the cross. A revelation, a revelation for us too, of a non-violent God in a very violent world. Now, this is Black History Month, so I'm going to focus my message on two themes. I already talked to you about injustice, but the second one's going to be violence. Now, I want to go to these two themes because they relate to Dr. King. That's what his life was about, injustice and violence. In fact, most of us, when they think of Dr. King, I know your mind went immediately to I have a dream. But that's not the point of that speech. You missed it. It was not about the vision. It was about the fact that he was trying to tell us that we've got to make freedom ring in this country. Listen to what he said in this climax of his speech. He said, let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the covertious slopes of California. But not only that, let freedom ring from Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and molehill in Mississippi. Let freedom ring from every mountainside. Let freedom ring. That was his theme that day. We get so caught up in the vision, we miss the theme. In fact, the words for that theme are taken from the hymn in your bulletin. Open it up and take it out. Open it up and take it out. Because <laughs> we're going to look at those words. This hymn, My Country Tis of Thee, was written in 1831 by a man by the name of Samuel Francis Smith. He was a seminary student in Massachusetts, and he was given a book of old German hymns by Lau Mason, and I know our musicians probably know these names, and asked to rewrite them. And he rewrote it to this hymn. My country, tis of thee. 
And I'm going to just read the words. You read them with me while I read them. Listen to these words. My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside, let freedom ring. Do you hear Dr. King's words? He just said, every mountain needs to let freedom ring. My native country, thee, land of the noble free, the name I love. I love thy rocks and rills, thy woods and templed hills. My heart with rapture thrills like that above. Let music swell the breeze and freedom from all the trees. Sweet freedom song. Let mortal tongues awake. Let all that breathe partake. Let rocks their silence break. The sound prolong. Our Father's God to thee, author of liberty, to thee we sing. Long may our land be bright with freedom's holy light. Protect us by thy might. Great God, our King. Now you can imagine this song was originally sang, I said in 1831, by a children's choir in Massachusetts. It was so beloved that everyone started singing it across the country. And by 1931, there actually were three songs in competition for the national anthem. We didn't have one up until that point. This song, America the Beautiful, again a song that talks about the land, the purple mountain's majesty, the sweet grains of amber, and then the Star Spangled Banner. Star Spangled Banner is about bombs bursting in air. Do you hear me? Bombs bursting in air. But they chose the Star Spangled Banner. I'm still trying to figure it out. Instead of choosing the song that was easiest to sing, that lifts up God, that talks about nature, they chose the one about war. Now, I'm going to get to that in a minute when I get to violence. So, this song also was part of the major social movements going on in this country in the 19th century. In the 19th century. Let me share with some of the ones that they had then. First of all, abolition versus slavery. Big, big social movement. Read your history, even though they don't want you to know it. Read your history, the abolitionist movement versus slavery. Right in our own Presbyterian church, read your history. That's why the church divided. Presbyterian church divided, and other churches too. Women's suffrage, rights for women. The rise of socialism versus capitalism. The spread of the Industrial Revolution the farm to factory movement. People lived on farms up until that point. They were now drawn into the cities to work in the factories where there's pollution, clean, uh, I mean, dirty air, dirty water. The universal education of the masses versus just the elite. This is a time also of great scholars. Nietzsche was a philosopher, Carl Jung in psychiatry, Du Bois, and also the time of religious conflict too. Charles Darwin and the beginning of religious controversy over evolution and creationism. Yes, during the 19th century, the importance of man's connection to nature. So this was the song that he wrote that connects man to nature. And guess which one we chose as our national anthem. Now, what makes the United States so unique? And where the center of patriotism and faith lies is the inheritability of Americans to strive for pure morality, embodied equally through both our concepts of liberty and justice for all. Our access to nature which can sometimes, and also individuals, which sometimes can be very, very problematic. Because if you think of yourself only as an individual, you don't think of others. Our morality, our personal emotion, and our salvation through nature. Themes which resonate throughout this song. Look at the words, it resonates throughout this song. 
Belief in nature as a moral space, a space for people to achieve spirituality, to reconnect with the essence of what makes them and this nation good. And what else makes us unique is, unique is the belief that we work, we are a work in progress. We are not where we should be. But we march toward a more perfect union of justice for all. But unfortunately, the freedom of this song has not rung for all people in this land. But with God's help, we can make freedom rise. We can yearn for the day when all of God's children who are able to sing with new meaning, purpose, and a sense of justice this line, let freedom ring. Knowing it is true, knowing that hatred towards people of color and different religious beliefs, be you Jewish, Muslim, be you of different racial and ethnic groups, Hispanic, Asian, or African descent, can let their voices rise, blend, and harmonize with people everywhere. More importantly, I yearn, and hopefully you learn with me, yearn for a day when our identity is found in God, who says who we are, rather than in our highs and lows, our successes and failures, and our shortcomings. Because when that happens, we can experience freedom and justice, the kind that God wants us to enjoy. Then we don't have to worry about race, ethnicity, our age, our gender, our sexual orientation, our mental or physical abilities. I yearn for the day when we can make a circle big enough, wide enough, to include everyone, to be who God wants us to be. Now, my second theme today was about violence. Now, we referenced that yesterday was supposed to be a day of violence in this country, just, just enough to make you want to weep. But we also understand that nonviolence was Dr. King's way of dealing with the powers that be. It was a movement in the context of a cultural diet of violence that we experience today. Recall that I just shared through you the second epiphany, the revelation of a nonviolent God in a very violent world. So you might ask yourself, whose fault is this? We accept this. Now, you can answer for yourself, but today, our children and youth are exposed to violent images through video and print media. It starts with the violence we see in the cartoons they watch. Cartoon characters that hit each other, beat each other, poke each other, get struck by heavy objects, get bricked, get bombed, get stomped on by their enemies. Really, is that what we want our kids to learn? And then we worry about bullying? There are even some movies where the hero seemingly never experiences pain or injury, just pure violence, and seems to overcome it. And let's not forget the historical images of violence in our history as we teach it. We teach history from periods of war. That's right now. Not from periods of peace, as God would like us to do, but from periods of violence, of war. When one's culture, society, history, religion, and perhaps even human nature, together weave a pattern of glorifying violence, Dr. King's philosophy takes on greater significance and becomes even more powerful in retrospect. Dr. King said nonviolence is a powerful weapon and a just weapon. He said, I'd like to see someone sponsor a bill making nonviolence the national weapon. Because just this week, I learned that Representative George Santos, whose name I really don't even know, said he wanted to make the AR-15 our national gun for, and weapon for the country. What is wrong with these people? Personally, I would like to walk, drive, shop, and go to church without fearing for my life and yours. Dr. King says the weapon we need to use is nonviolence. It's unique in history. It cuts without wounding and ennobles the man who wields that sword. It's a sword that can heal. And so I believe that at some point when we go back and look at historic periods in this country, we will consider that movement the, most, the greatest social religious movement in the world. 
violence causes suffering and trauma. Suffering and, tra and trauma. But our revelation is that we have a nonviolent God in this violent world. In his collection of pilgrims to nonviolence and suffering and faith, Dr. King said this, my personal trials have taught me the value of unmerited suffering. As my sufferings mounted, I soon realized that there were two ways I could respond, either react with bitterness or transform the suffering into a creative force. And that was nonviolence. To save myself from bitterness, I've attempted to see my ordeals as an opportunity to transform myself and heal the people involved in this tragic situation. In recent months, I've become more and more convinced of the reality of a personal God. Perhaps the suffering and the frustration and the agonizing moments have drawn me closer to God, he said. Whatever the cause, God has been profoundly real to me. In the midst of danger, I have felt an inner calm and known the resource of strength that only God can give. What a powerful testimony to our merciful, gracious, efficient God. Powerful words for a powerful faith. The Presbyterian Church has made overtures to take action, not just in word, but also in deed, to address the worsening plight of those who are in need in this country and the world. In fact, even rejecting racism, they said, we believe that racism is the opposite of what God intends for humanity. It is the rejection of the other, which is entirely contrary to the word of God incarnate in Jesus Christ. Racism is a lie we tell about our fellow human beings, for it says that some are less than others. Because of our biblical understanding of who God is and what God intends for humanity, the Presbyterian Church must stand, speak, and work against racism. In 2013, the world came together to rise against violence against women, because that's also a problem in this country and in the world. There's a new movement that's come about. It's called More Than One Billion Rising, Rising for Freedom. This movement began as a call to action based on the statistic that one of three women, one in three women in the world will be subjected to violence in their lifetimes. Since the world's population is more than 8 billion, that means that more than a billion women have had to deal with violence in their lives. They're calling for systemic change, being conscious of the violence that women face, and a radical resistance to the end of that violence. They're calling for solidarity against the exploitation of women and girls. They call for us to rise up, to resist and to unite, and to work for working class women and minority women and girls who are on the margins of society to connect with our common humanity. They call for us to rise up through art, through action, through imagination. They call for us to establish rise up gardens that promote revival, restoration, and transformation to honor and protect the earth. They call for us to rise up for the bodies of all women and girls so we can reclaim express, defy, unite, radicalize, and revolutionize, and transform the world, knowing that there are forces trying to remove the rights of women and of those who are attacking women, denying history, banning books, criminalizing and suppressing dissent, and abusing power. They have declared 2023 a state of emergency. They call on the world to rise for freedom, freedom from poverty, from division, from shame, from greed, from violence, and a place, in its place, put a culture where we value, value each other collectively, a beloved community. So this is our message this morning. From our scripture from Isaiah, from our scripture from Matthew, that God has said when we loose the chains of injustice, Set the oppressed free, share food with the hungry, shelter the homeless, clothe the naked, turn away, not turn away from our own, 
Where have you heard this message before? Jesus said the same thing, that our light will break forth, that healing will appear, and that righteousness will go before us, and the glory of the Lord will protect us on all sides. The result, we will call, we will pray, and the Lord will answer, here I am. So brothers and sisters this morning, I challenge you to respond to the needs of our brothers and sisters in the diaspora. To take the words from Dr. King from our scripture that tell us that when we seek God's face, he will lift every valley. He will make the hills and the mountains low. He will make the rough, rough places plain. He will take the crooked places and make them straight so that we can see the glory of the Lord revealed to us. We have to walk when we can't run. We never can get weary because we know and believe it's possible to achieve the promised land of freedom and justice, God's beloved community. And when we dedicate our lives to this task, when we do, freedom will indeed rise. Amen. Let's say it with feeling. This is saying what you believe in your heart. God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Let us go to the throne of grace. Eternal God, as we begin this Lenten journey with Jesus in the wilderness, our struggles and temptations become all too real. Emptying ourselves of that which teases and tempts us to turn from you and turn towards idols of comfort that don't satisfy and don't last. We pray for you to open us to your truth and guide us in Christ's path. All too often, Lord, we choose the path that is known, the path that is comfortable. This Lent, let us pause and look around and discern where we are and how we got here. Let us pause and ask ourselves, is this position faithful? Do we need to redirect? What can we learn from where we've been? And what new path might we need to forge to be more faithful in the future? What assumptions have we made? What can we let go? What truth do we need to steal ourselves to face the crosses we must bear? Help us, Lord, with our Latin reckoning. Lord, we ask too in this moment of prayer, we pause now to decenter ourselves and our needs, focus on the needs of others. Hear our prayers and pleas on the behalf of your people. You know their names, Lord. You know who they are. You know their circumstances, Lord. You know they're those who are mourning, those who are ill, those who need comfort, those who are in isolation, those who are in pain those who are facing troubling times. And we ask, Lord, that you, you and only you, can send your healing balm to help us during this time. Lord, we just ask, we just ask that and pray for those who are fleeing violence, those who are dealing with sickness and their caregivers, those who are seeking healing from trauma, those who are leaders who need to be following God's way and not their own way. Lord, we pray for those who are fighting after natural disasters, such as the earthquakes in Syria and in Turkey. Lord, we ask for those who are dealing with war across the globe, not just in Ukraine, but all over this world where there's war. In your mercy, God, we ask you to hear the prayers of the people to help us to walk with you during this season.
so we can learn and grow in your embrace. And Lord, we, help, we ask you to help us follow the footsteps steps of our Savior who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Our charge, brothers and sisters, we still have work to do. We want to discern the power, the power we have in Jesus Christ to transform the world. We must be God's nonviolent <coughs> disciples in a very violent war. Freedom has not rung, but with God's help, we can make freedom rise. And now, to the God who made us in his image, with unique differences and gifts, to his son, Jesus, who showers us with grace upon grace. To the Holy Spirit, which helps us channel our gifts for God's purpose. Be all honor and praise forever and ever. Amen. Thank you so much for inviting me to worship with you today.